I want to start with this assertion, which is that um, knowing is not sustainable. So our education system around the world that we've been using for roughly the last 200 years has been designed to take a set of ideas and information that we have decided is necessary and to force feed it into young humans in an assembly line industrial mechanism to basically try to turn these wonderful creations into these, into computers and robots. Because in the Industrial Revolution, we needed people that could intake, process, and regurgitate information in somewhat reliable ways. And we needed people that were really good at following directions. There was also something about um, creating uh, people that would follow the orders of the state very well as well. If you look at the history of where our education system came from during the, uh, co uh, the coalition of uh, bringing the German and Prussian Empire together. Um, the problem with that now, as uh, my friend Munnit Jane and others have spoken about, is that the robots and computers we have now are way better at all those things that we've been trying to get ourselves to do than we can now do. So not only are we shooting for the wrong target with all of this information we're trying to cram into our kids 24-7 now, right? 24-7 learning. We can cram information into our kids 24-7 now. We're heading for a target that is long gone. those jobs are taken by the robots and the machines and the preparation that we're preparing our kids for gone we needed to make this change 30 years ago in my opinion and the research i think is showing very very well that how we are going about trying to cram this information in mass production assembly line form into our children is actually creating the opposite of everything that we want for them. Not only in terms of outcomes, but who we want them to be. All those words that are on all of our websites, lifelong learner, the, all our websites say the same stuff now, right? We're developing the opposite of all of those things by the mechanisms that we're using to get all of this information that we think our kids need to turn them into computers and robots is. We have a reduction in empathy. We're measuring this now over the last 50, 60 years. We have a reduction in resilience, in executive function, in self-regulation, in creativity. We have an increase in narcissism, and suicide, and psychological disorders, and external locus of control, and an affinity for authoritarian rule. And this is all due to how we are educating our children. And I would argue how we're parenting them. So when we talk about how are we going to transform our education system in our schools, I think there's only one option. We have to change how we are teaching. Because how we teach actually teaches more than what we are trying to teach. Because all learning is experiential. We are never not learning. The lessons that we are learning really, really well in school are not the ones we think we're teaching. Let's take the example of mathematics. When we teach maths, almost nobody remembers any of it. Unless you're using it every day in your job, we all settle back down to the same basic level of math that we've actually shown very well that every human will learn if they are in a safe community with educated people without formal instruction. This is what we're teaching our kids perfectly. Almost 100% success rate and for the rest of our lives. The math disappears. We learn to hate math. We learn to dislike learning in general. We learn to feel inadequate. And we learn that what we really need to do is get in a position of power 
so that we don't have other people powering on us and making us do stuff all the time, and then we learn how to do that to others, to make ourselves feel like we have some control of our lives. The list goes on and on and on. Oop. Of all the things we want for our kids on the left-hand side, we want them to be able to learn anything, but we're training them to be dependent on others for how to learn. Big one, we were just talking about this. We want them to be consensual in relationships. Every child in almost every school in the world is in a non-consensual environment, and then we wonder why what we have going on in our world is happening. We are training them to be this way. This quote for me sums it up so beautifully the absurdity of what we're doing in our schools. And I say we because I am a teacher. I grew up in this, I've been in this, and I've done this, and I still do some of this, and I'm, I'm recovering, <laughs> right? We ask 18-year-olds to make huge decisions about their career and financial future, and I would say about everything in our lives. So in, in the United States, at age 18, we graduate from high school, and we say, okay, now you're an adult. A week ago, they had to say, excuse me, may I go to the bathroom, please? How can you live in 18 years of an authoritarian rule and then walk out the door and know how to live in a democracy? It doesn't make any sense. So this isn't a talk about how our education system is, um, you know, not what we need it to be. We all know to some extent that it's not right. The momentum is huge. We're trying to change it and we're working with that. There are book after book and talk after talk and these are a few and I'm recognizing that these are all men on this. After I put the slide together, um, Linda Darling Hammond, um, uh, so many other wonderful books and talks by women that are as good or better than these. Um, this is a book that I absolutely love. I saw this in an airport. Uh, I, I lived in Bali, Indonesia for a while. Um, why A students work for C students. And B students work for the government because they were trying to be A students, but they weren't quite good enough at following the directions and et cetera. Um, and I love this book's actually in Indonesian, Bas Indonesia, I found this picture online. So here's what I see happening in all the schools that I visit around the world. I see it over and over and over again, that we're still focused on what's. We say, design thinking's gonna do it. Brain-based learning, social-emotional, PBL, mindfulness, STEM. We bring that in, and then we force-feed that to our children under threat of punishment and shaming, and that will solve it. I see schools break every one of these by using the same how which is that we know what you need and we're gonna make you do it or else. So we're using an authoritarian, coercive, non-consensual environment to try to create all the things we list on our website. And it won't ever, ever, ever happen. So I would argue that what we really need to do, the one thing that we need to do is we need to rehumanize education. We had wonderful um, talks uh, about how India has in its history already knows how. We talk about traditional education, like, hey, there's alternative, and traditionally we go and we do this. The education system of the last 200 years is not traditional. It's a radical departure from how human beings have learned for tens of thousands of years and India was doing it, every traditional society was doing it before a couple hundred years ago. So I think we know as human beings, we have evolved to learn what we need to learn of the tools of our society. If we are in a safe space with resources around us, we will learn what we need to learn. Okay, I'm very preachy, aren't I? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have to share what's in my heart. Um, and one of the things I wanna share is um, I have had the great fortune to be able to be able to build learning environments from the ground up with no restrictions. And I know many of you are very jealous of that and, <laughs> and, and it, is a, it is an extreme uh, luck to be able to do that. But I wanna share a little bit about some of the things that we've been building and that other people are building around the world at Oroville and other places that are built on a how that doesn't really care about the what. 
trusting that the what will get taken care of and focusing on the how. And then I want to share how we work with schools to try to help the ones that have the timetables and the structures and the classes and the subjects. What can we do to change without blowing up the whole thing and having an immediate revolution? How can we change something that begins moving us in that direction? So that's what I'll share in the time I have left. So this is Leap Academy, a program I started at Green School in Bali while I was there with a wonderful um, colleague and friend um, that was built on simply this. And this is what I think if we can do as schools in general and hold true to it, is simply shift, make this one shift. I would argue that our, our there aren't a thousand kinds of schools, Waldorf, Montessori. There are two kinds. There's the kind that say, we know what you need, do what we tell you or else. And there are the kinds that say, how shall we explore the world together? Those are the two kinds of schools, to my mind. And most of them are currently under the do what we tell you or else model, and we're getting what we get. So we built this program based on, what are your goals and how can I help you? How together might we get there? Um, just because it's so beautiful, and if you haven't been with Mind Mingle to visit Green School in Bali, this is an aerial view of where we built Leap Academy, um, and then we use that now also uh, in other places. Um, really a wonderful place, no walls, um, built out of bamboo. Um, so video goes here is the slide where these guys then um, play a short video to just show the first day of school in Leap Academy. You you create the tree in the rabbit hole. What's the name of the knot? A uh, bowline. Okay. And you come out the rabbit hole, around the tree, and back in the hole. And then you just pull. And that is a locking knot. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Just make sure. Yeah. So here's the really important part about the tree. You do it, but I'll show you. When you make the tree, it should have it so that the tree trunk is not in front, but behind. Okay? So you go out, around, and in. Around the tree trunk? <laughs> okay, you, you do it from here. But as long as the tree is behind, the... Hey, are you doing a time lapse? <laughs> okay, out, and then... Around the tree? So this is the tree, right? Comes around and back in. Uh, and then that guy won't move. That's what seafarers do. Okay. So the idea of this is hold it straight. You might need to pull that way or that way a little bit, yeah. I need someone on this side too. Okay, here I come. So um, that was the first day of class and the first day of this school within a school called Leap Academy where we were building our space together and identifying what we needed. And you saw there, how do we get the furniture up to this second level when the staircase is this wide? One of the things that I love about this video is that it shows that she was shown something and then just walk away, and she asked for that help when she needed it, and he came back and did it. And at the end, he asked, what's the idea here? The kids planned all of this, how to get the furniture up there. So our curriculum of decide where we're going to have our school and what does it need was day one. By the end of day one, we had our school, our space, and we got started working. There we go. Okay, so just a, a quick picture of the space uh, where we then um, had our school and decided every day what we would do. Uh, just uh, a part of our group, a uh, wonderful group of young uh, international students um, from around the world, some uh, Indonesian also. And uh, the formula of this school that is still running inside the school in Green School, in the high school, is simply this. Half the time, we'll work together on real projects of real value to our community. 
We'll decide together what those are in conversation with our broader community about what they need and how we can help. And then the other half of the time, we'll work on solo or individual endeavors to meet our academic and personal growth goals, and we'll work on how we help each other do that. That's it. There's no hours and hours and hours of planning any curriculum. Simply that. The skills we need as human beings, the ones that are going to have jobs, as Manet said, in 20 years, the 20% of humanity that actually is working, are going to be the, the ones who can do that every day. Come together with other human beings and figure out what they want to do and how they're going to do it, not the ones that can regurgitate information and follow directions really well. Those human beings will not have employment and we're still training them for that. This is how learning works, and these are the ones that can do this are the humans that will have jobs. So that was a new growth experience. We have existing structures in millions and millions and millions and millions of kids, and we as teachers are in existing structures. How do we change? We all know we try over and over, and it's so difficult. I would argue that what we do is we infuse in that space a how of engaging together that is human. And then everything else will work itself out. We'll figure it out together. We can have growing in these spaces again, actual humanness, where we can deal with these wicked problems, as they now call them, like global warming, that we need to be able to solve. So, if all we do is just remember that how we teach teaches more than what it is that we are trying to teaching, trying to teach, we can then solve it. We can shift the outcomes to that right column, all the ones that are on our website, that in many, many cases we are actually delivering the opposite of. Even given the goodness of our hearts, this is not we teachers beating the children. This is simply telling them what to do every moment. So we need to rehumanize education. How do we do that in the structures we have? I would argue that if we think about these three things, we will do a very good job of moving in that direction. If we relate equitably with the young humans and all humans, leaders, if we don't relate equitably with our teachers, they will not relate equitably with the students, and the students will not relate equitably with each other. Our schools are bully factories, if you look at how power flows downhill. We practice co-creation. We learn together with our young ones, and we be vulnerable. We stop pretending that we are already there and know everything and lie to the kids day to day, as we often do as adults. We know, that's why we're telling you. So, if we relate equitably, we'll shift to this. We talk about it as flipping accountability. Students are accountable to us now. That doesn't, that's not equity. Use yes and instead of or else. These are very simple things, but they transform learning communities. Yes, and you're choosing to do that. Hmm. I wonder, is that going to get you where you want to go? What's that going to do to your relationship with this other human being or with me? Here's how I feel about that, rather than or else. Our language is incredibly powerful. We use these words all the time. I own your time. You are mine. You owe me. It's not time to. It's not on here, but this is the one I cannot stand the most. It's not time to play. It's time to learn. We're never not learning, and we're training kids to think that learning is one thing and the is another. Play is how humans have evolved to learn, right? Co-creation. Do with, not to or for. I love this quote, and Shaquille, I'm only going to go two minutes over instead of 20 minutes this time. Uh, people are happier, more cooperative and productive, and more likely to make positive change when those in authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. 
Ted Wachtel is uh, in restorative practices. Learn together. Take ourselves from outside the team of learners and bring ourselves onto the team with them and say, what shall we learn? Or we have signed up for this class, how will we learn that together? Or we've been told we have to learn this or we won't get entrance to the next level of hoops that we need to jump through, that we've decided we want to. How are we gonna do that and remain human together? We can still do stuff we don't want to do <laughs> as humans and do it humanly. Um, build open structures so that the rest of us in those structures have room to build our own structures. We call those wireframes. Use enlistment. Shall we do this? Yes? Okay, yes, let's do that. Be vulnerable. We want vulnerability and adaptability in our kids, but we need to model that if we want them to have it. We need to make visible our thinking, our process, and our needs. Wonder aloud. Celebrate our own curiosity. I wonder about this. I wonder what you wonder. Ask for help from them. We build relationship in two directions. Embrace failure. Ultimately, we need to prioritize relationship over things. We can learn things. We don't even know the things they need to know. We need to stop pretending. We don't know. But we do know that they need to know how to learn. So these are the three things. We often say it doesn't work because we open a tiny crack of freedom in an authoritarian environment and then they go crazy. Of course they do. They're blowing off steam. See it happen all the time. Well, we went th sent them to follow directions class, and then to submit or rebel class, and then to memorize and regurgitate class, and then to relinquish your interests, and then to don't fail, and then use power, not influence. And then we sent them to, you know, solve uh, challenges co-creatively, and it, they didn't do it, and we can't figure out why. <laughs> we have to be in that space as a way of being. Very quickly for leaders, we have to create clarity that we want this in our schools because otherwise teachers aren't safe. Parents will come to them and other teachers are almost the worst. If you give kids freedom in your class, the other teachers will come at you like nothing you've ever seen. You're making it difficult for me in my class because now the children want to have a say in what's happening because of what you're allowing. Leaders, we have to protect that space and we have to provide training, time to talk together about how to work through this, and some structures that support it, like ending the isolation of teaching. Two people together iterate and evolve so much faster than one alone. One final thing, we do not disrupt anything by bringing the thing through the existing structure. If we do, it takes the shape and the flavor of the thing we're trying to change, and it might have different words, but it's the exact same thing. Create what we call an anomalous space inside your community that is built from the ground up any way you want to and invite people in. Families will want it, and so will some teachers, and then everybody in it will want to be there, and you won't have people trying to break it. And then you'll get to see what it actually looks and feels like to have the kind of education that I think all of us know in our heart we want to feel, but most of us have never felt because we've never been in that environment. That's how you can do it. And we, that's how we do it, and it works. So, I think there's only two kinds, and we need to stop thinking there's thousands of these what's because there are only two hows. We have to rehumanize education if we're going to get what we want out of it. I love this quote, a request creates the possibility for an expression of love, whereas a demand suffocates that possibility. If we just look at how we're interacting with the people in our communities, including the little ones, and remember that, then we will get the outcomes that we want. I want to thank you so much for being here. It's been a real honor. Thank you.